<laughs> Next, I would like to introduce Glenn Ford, who is the executive editor of the Black Agenda Report. Glenn is a um, widely, uh, widely respected activist and commentator on national and international topics. Um, he, is, he is an important voice in the United National Anti-War Coalition, and um, like Tony Montero said earlier, he's really educated the world in his blog. So without further ado, hand it over to you. Thank you. Power to the people. Power to the people. I was, uh, I discovered something I didn't know about uh, two days ago. Uh, I discovered that Philadelphia is the largest concentration, third largest concentration of black people within a municipality uh, in the country, uh, right behind uh, New York and Chicago. Uh, that is, people living within the borders uh, you know, of, of the city. And I think that has a, a lot to do with the stats that Sally uh, was citing in terms of poverty uh, and deep poverty. And while Tony was talking, uh, he was uh, discussing the, the, uh, the US proxy regime, uh, mercenary <coughs> government in, in Rwanda, uh, and uh, this, uh, uh, this genocide uh, that, that didn't quite happen the way they say it, at least. Uh, in, in Rwanda, uh, the Tutsis, the minority uh, ethnic group, uh, were said before the genocide to number 15% of the population. And now after the genocide, they still number 15% of the population. Uh, something very strange uh, there. Uh, also, uh, the United States, uh, of, of course, uh, arms Rwanda to the hilt. Uh, Rwanda's government, uh, Paul Kagame's regime, uh, is the darling of lots of people uh, who call themselves Leftists. This is a minority regime. This is 15% of the population lording it over uh, the 80% uh, uh, Hutu and, and other uh, uh, ethnic groups, uh, and and no one discusses it. Discusses this as as in fact a a a, a, a minority uh, regime. Uh, in fact, it's almost taboo uh, to badmouth Kagame. Uh, and Rwanda because of this genocide that seemingly did not lessen the Tutsi population uh, at all. Uh, I want to talk about uh, the phenomenon that, uh, that I call uh, disaster banksterism. I, I think that's really the subject uh, uh, here. And that's disaster capitalism where the finance capitalists are in charge. And uh, that is the case in the United States today. This is finance capital at the helm. It's not General Motors anymore. It's Wall Street. Uh, I think that it's necessary uh, to understand what the bankster class wants to do uh, in order to properly uh, make sense out of the crisis uh, that has been imposed on urban black America. Uh, the rule of Wall Street is not the same as the rule of General Motors, not the same as the rule of the manufacturing capitalists. Uh, these manufacturing capitalists have been eclipsed by uh, the banksters. Uh, it is the rule of finance capital that has given gentrification and privatization such a furious and frenzied character today. It's intensifying all the time, uh, including, as the gentleman uh, uh, alluded to, uh, their uh, brazen attempt to just go straight into the bank accounts of the people of Cyprus. Not, not even any, 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 any uh, uh, not, not going through multiple stages of theft as they do here when you transfer the money over here and it finally gets to them at stage five, just going straight uh, in the bank. Now that's the kind of furious frenzy that they are about. Uh, I, I want to emphasize that finance capital, I believe, behaves in many ways differently than manufacturing capital, a and that we need to recognize the differences uh, in the, the behavior between finance and manufacturing capitalists 
if we're going to confront the crisis uh, that uh, black people are suffering in the uh, urban areas. It's a crisis of theft, uh, a crisis of expropriation of the public sphere, and especially expropriation of the public sphere where black people are nominally in charge. It's a crisis of forced migration, a crisis of push out. And all of this requires the application of the heavy hand of the criminal injustice system. And therefore, it is also a human rights crisis. So I, I, I want to talk about this army of, of the unemployed, because uh, socialists are always talking about the army uh, of the unemployed. And black folks are represented in that army uh, at a two to one ratio to white people. Uh, I believe that the old manufacturing capitalist class uh, viewed the great mass of unemployed and insecure workers and black <laughs> workers differently than the current rulers, the finance capitalists do. Uh, the manufacturing class viewed the unemployed as a reserve of cheap labor uh, that would be available for exploitation at will. It was glad they were there. Uh, and the very presence of large numbers of desperate workers had a value to the manufacturing capitalists because that would, of course, bring down the wage demands of everybody else who had a job or hoped to have a job. In that kind of situation, working people tend to see other people uh, who are in need of work as representing a threat to them. And that, of course, is quite good for capitalists. Uh, the capitalist wants unemployed and desperate people around and within easy reach of him so that he can scare the whole workforce into submission just by their very presence. Uh, in that kind of situation, black workers had a very particular value to the manufacturing capitalists because they were especially scary uh, to white workers. And when it came to black workers, solidarity went out the window in terms of white workers. And that was very good for the factory owners. So black workers had a particular usefulness to manufacturing capitalists uh, at that historical juncture. My grandfather uh, was one of those useful uh, workers. Uh, he died in 1979 at the age of 100. Uh, during the 1920s, he jumped on what he told me was a freedom train. Uh, that freedom train would roll through Georgia and the Carolinas at the speed that a man walked. And it was composed of uh, boxcars with the doors open and empty. And uh, unemployed farmhands and farmers who had lost their land and other folks would just get on the freedom train <coughs> and ride north uh, to jobs. My grandfather got on that train in the 20s and he rode to Cleveland where he uh, got a job with the railroad uh, to undermine the union. In other words, he was a straight strike, uh, strike breaker. And he called that uh, a freedom train. Uh, often when we talk about uh, black migration to the north, uh, we talk in terms of people fleeing the south, uh, but in many cases, and in a, a real sense, we were invited uh, to the North. The manufacturers had a particular use for us. So now I want to fast forward uh, to the great suburbanization of America, and that begins in the late 40s and uh, uh, goes into a frenzy in the 50s. And it changed the whole landscape uh, of the country. Um, it broke the mold, in fact, of, of the world civilizational uh, model. Uh, all of a sudden, what we have are hollowed out uh, urban centers with a ring of wealth around it. That had never happened uh, in human history. In fact, it's quite irrational. Uh, but it was done so that, you, so that there would be a new market to exploit uh, and the value of these previously underdeveloped lands in the country, this cheap land, uh, all of a sudden could be, uh, could be uh, pumped up, inflated, because there was development 
uh, in the suburbs, and, and that's how that engine uh, got started. Uh, I'm going to go quickly flip through the uh, urban rebellions of the 60s and the rise of mass black incarceration as the national policy of the United States, because I know that uh, in the course of the evening, uh, other people will uh, take a closer look at that. Uh, by the mid-1970s, we have black majorities or uh, large pluralities of blacks in many, many of the major cities of the country. Uh, those cities had been methodically, systematically disinvested by finance capital when they were doing their suburbanization campaign. Uh, but something else was also happening in the 70s. Uh, we started to hear the term globalization. What was actually occurring, and I think the mid-70s is about the, the, the right time to look at that phenomenon, what was really occurring was the start of a new stage or a new chapter uh, in the story of capitalism. Finance capital was becoming dominant and it was systematically disassembling the industrial infrastructure of the United States and it started sending that infrastructure to the global south. By the early 1980s, the financial arm of General Motors, that's GMAC, was making more profits than the factories of General Motors were. Uh, and I remember, it was about 1982, and I said, ah, there's the handwriting on the wall. The changeover uh, is, uh, is unfolding. Uh, wall Street was then in ascension. Uh, they began taking the manufacturing sector apart, and they sent it overseas. Uh, now we have a class, this financial capitalist class, that is in charge, and it makes nothing. It makes nothing of value. We must always remember that. They don't make anything. They play with money. Uh, they make society a prisoner of their instruments, and they rig markets but they do not invest in the production of things of use to humanity. But most of all, what these lords of capital do is inflate the value of assets, that which they own or that which they hope to own. They boost artificially the value, and uh, that's especially obvious in land and buildings, but since they commodify everything, uh, uh, it, it can apply to uh, things beyond real estate. Uh, they then looked at the cities, and those are the cities that they had disinvested uh, in the 50s and accelerated <coughs> disinvestment uh, in the 60s, uh, and they decided that they wanted these cities back, uh, that these were areas of interest for their manipulation. A and in taking them back, uh, they were just doing what, what bankers did naturally. They boosted or attempted to boost the value of those urban assets. That is the means by which these financial uh, people <laughs> reproduce themselves and make wealth for themselves by inflating uh, prices, by boosting the values. That also is the imperative of gentrification. It, it looks like, when we talk about gentrification, it appears to most people uh, that gentrification is a rush of white people who are voluntarily uh, returning to the cities that they abandoned uh, long ago. <clears throat> but the engine of that population shift is the methodical inflation of urban properties, of urban assets. Uh, that is in the hands that is engineered by the finance capitalists. The presence of black people, especially poor black people, puts an absolute limit on how much they can inflate the value of urban properties or even of, of, of an urban lifestyle. They sell that uh, as well. That's because white people uh, in large numbers will not buy or settle in heavily black areas, and therefore there is a limit on how they can inflate the value of their assets. Therefore,
black folks must go. At least black poor people must go. So what I'm talking about here is the, is the, the economic engine uh, that drives this. So that we don't think in, of gentrification just in terms of, oh yeah, they're coming back to our neighborhood now, who do they think they are? There is a huge machine uh, that is propelling this gentrification. Gentrification is a push out. It's not just people moving in. It is a push out, and it is a push out by capital. Finance capital cannot tolerate a heavily black <coughs> presence in areas where asset values are to be inflated. That is not tolerable. That diminishes their ability to make profits. And so we see that with gentr gentrification uh, comes draconian policing policies, such as stop and frisk. Uh, and those policies have spread to many cities. They go by different names, uh, but we know what we're talking about. Philadelphia's stop and frisk uh, regime per capita was even more intense than New York's, although New York gets all the play. It's crystal clear, I believe, uh, that, and certainly in New York, uh, that stop and frisk is about more than simply controlling black populations, and it's about more than simply feeding the prison industrial complex. It is about that, but it's about more than that. It's about creating as hostile an environment as possible for black people in those cities uh, where capital wants to move them out. This is a banksters regime, uh, and they have no use, no use for a strong black presence <coughs> in our cities. It devalues their assets and their ability to inflate those assets and to raise the price of their property. And they will kill you behind the price of their property. This is how they reproduce themselves. Uh, manipulating asset prices is what finance capitalists do because they don't make anything. They are only game riggers. The freedom train uh, that my grandfather rode to Cleveland does not pass through Georgia or South Carolina anymore. It doesn't pass through any place in the United States. It runs through Latin America and the rest of the global south. Those are the people who perform the function uh, that my grandfather did in the 1920s. Uh, in the 1940s and the 1950s, uh, finance capital and its representatives in government turned rural land uh, into suburban development. And that boosted those assets astronomically. Now, capital's focus is on the city. And those cities are full of black people and brown people. In many cases, the lords of capital would prefer to just start from scratch, to just get a level, level playing board. Uh, Hurricane Katrina uh, gave them what they thought was an opportunity to do that in New Orleans. And uh, no, no sooner had the place dried out a little bit than they were talking about making it into something like a theme park, <laughs> which would actually be just holding the property until it could be developed uh, later. Uh, in Detroit, they are uh, feverishly attempting to accelerate what has already been uh, a drastic decline in population. Uh, they deliberately, systematically withhold city services from selected neighborhoods uh, so that, well, in hopes that the people will just move away. And this is not something on the download. This is not secret. This is not some, some subtext. This is not a motive that we read into them. This is open city policy. They talk about it all, all the time. That's their uh, agenda. Uh, and this is a black government. Oh, That's right. right. That's what do it. Controlled by business. And you have one of those, too. <laughs> and we see variations on the same theme uh, as in Detroit, uh, as, uh, as in New Orleans. Not necessarily as dramatic, but it's the same uh, theme. Uh, the lords of capital are inexorably dispersing black communities across the United States. That is the pattern. They have no use for these populations, not even as a reserve army of the unemployed. They 
want black folks gone so that they can boost the value of these assets. This is occurring amidst the great wave of privatization that is the global imperative of finance capital. Finance capital is stripping bare the public sector and of course <laughs> getting into your private bank account too. Uh, those, those privatizations have crippled public education in black America through the school closings that were talked about earlier and through charterization, which is an attempt to set up an alternative privatized school system. Barack Obama is its greatest and most effective uh, proponent. And the hedge funds are in the vanguard of the charterization uh, move. So how do we defend our communities from being swept away in this crisis uh, since Wall Street will not tolerate our presence where we live? Uh, I think we start by understanding that the banks are our main enemy, and we say so. Uh, this is a crisis of bankster disaster capitalism. Uh, we should be talking about the dissolution of this financial capitalist class. We shouldn't be uh, tripping around and, and uh, around the subject and finding euphemisms uh, or half-ass measures, uh -oh. measures <laughs> <laughs> like breaking up the banks or, or somehow uh, preventing them from giving uh, themselves million dollar bonuses. Uh, that doesn't get to the heart of the matter. That doesn't slow them down. Uh, breaking up the big five banks into 15 banks would not lessen uh, the power of concentrated capital. They have many ways to communicate. Uh, we, I believe, must unabashedly uh, speak, and especially in black America, where the most intensely targeted uh, populations gather, we must unabashedly call for the destruction of this uh, finance capitalist bankster class. <laughs> this is something that Wall Street tiptoed, well, excuse me, occupied Wall Street, uh, tiptoed up to, uh, but did not uh, do. Uh, banksters are the least popular people, the most hated people in this country. If you can't call uh, for the dissolution of their class, then you can't call for much of anything. Uh, we have to talk about socialism because that's the only solution. And I think uh, that the average person regarding the banks will, think, will also agree. Power to the people.